Miss Seno has over the last has has over the last 18 years been involved in community based work on issues of women rights governance natural resource management and sustainable livelihood as for our second facilitator uh, he needs no introduction it's dr wati longchar who is uh, the leading uh, in this uh, leadership training program he is the regional consultant for theological education in south and east india uh, as for today's session uh, the facilitators will be given 30 minutes each to present their lectures one after the another and after their lectures we will have the discussion question and discussion uh, during the discussion and session period uh, if you have any question you can ask either in audio or you can type your question or queries in the chat box and we would be grateful if you can direct to whom the question is if it is to Ms. Seno or to Dr. Wati Longchar. Now for the first session, uh, I give time to Ms. Seno. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we have decided that I take first. Oh, okay, okay. Then uh, over to Dr. Wati. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Sashi, for this time. And then I have prepared a short PowerPoint, let me uh, this is the one. So short but uh, 83 slides, but I will make it short. Now it's eight uh, six thirty-four. So I will take my you know 30 minutes time. What we have heard, we have heard that the rural and vulnerable communities are hit very hard, uh, badly by the COVID pandemic. And then I got one word from Sino here. She said, we must safeguard the government resources land, water, forest, seeds, traditional medicine, people's knowledge and culture and retain them in the hands of the community. Uh, and then I hit one word there, not in the hands of the corporate. It should be owned by the community, but not by a few corporates. It is dangerous to hand over God's land, life sustaining power of land, you know, to a few manipulators, handing over the world and its resources to a few corporate is the root cause of the collapse of food distribution system. Now we are uh, busy. Sorry, uh, Dr. Wati, I need to interrupt. If I am the only one, but uh, your slide, it's not visible. We we are not able to see your slide. Really? But uh, it is, it says- yes. None of us, none of us can see your presentation. Okay, let me try again. Then uh, I'm very sorry. Can you see now? Uh, yes, we can see now. Oh, then uh, the devil spirit was controlling me. Okay. The COVID-19 has proof that the present market system cannot save the poor. On contrary, an unjust market system has killed many people. We also have, I uh, that we need for food security. Uh, we need food security for 
a dignified life. Providing fish is important in disastrous, disastrous situation. Time of giving fish is getting over as the COVID surge is subsiding, coming down. Now we need to start how do fish, how do build fishery bound, dig fishery bound, so that our people live a sustainable life even in the coming years. Our problem is that we want to become rich in overnight without work, especially many young people. Huh? We think that misuse of government money is okay. We think that it is a blessing. Sometimes, even by the pastor, glorify those character by praising them, by, you know, saying that these officers are God-fearing, although that person is giving uh, stolen money. But we have to uh, stress that it is a sin. We are misusing common property, and misuse of common property is sin. Now, again, everybody look a government job only. But young people do not want to take risks and engage in creative entrepreneurship. That's why we have so much of unemployment problem. No, no job. Who is creating this unemployment problem? Not by anybody, it is by you and I. This is what we have to know. We were told that if you don't want to work, you must study hard. This is what my parents keep on saying, you know. If you don't want to work in the sun, in the rain, you must study hard. We were never told that study hard, to work hard, to help the community, to enhance the quality of life, to create jobs. Huh? We were never told. We were never told that enabling people to have food security and involved in sustainable development is part of Christian ministry, part of Christian life. We were told that church exists for the soul winning alone. This is a wrong theology and that theology continue to uh, make a lot of people in, live in power. Our education system produces job seekers graduate. So many graduates are producing, but they look only for the government job. But we don't produce job graders graduate. We must, once you have you are graduated in a college, means you must be able to create many jobs. But our education system is faulty. Again, very funny thing is we look down those who cannot get government job. Parents look down. Parents think that they have not got a job. But we have to realize that a government cannot give job to all citizens. Again, we look down the villagers uh, in uh, Nagamis, Bustiwala. We think that Going to the cities in downs is the final goal of life you have achieved. Villages, big what? Cities civilized. This is what, you know, we think. We want to eat without working. Every person actually must produce, must become a producer, not consumer alone. So, providing fish is important in a disaster situation like COVID pandemic. The church has done so much of commendable work, but 
this alone is not enough. Now we need to engage in the long-term work. We need to teach our people how to fish and help to build fishery bound. We need, uh, this need has to start now, not in future, because the rural and the poor people are suffering, hit hard by the COVID pandemic. I, as a remedy, I suggest three things here. Three ways of transformation. And then I want to focus only on three because I have a very limited time. Number one, uh, self-employment is not making money alone. We are looking for self-employment, not just for money, but we want to transform our villages and then we want to benefit the whole community. This is, uh, this is what the, we want to do. We want to transform our culture. We want to protect our culture for social development. Not only one particular community, but whole community. There are so much things that can contribute. Mm. And also, we want the land to grow food. Not only vegetable and other things, but so many things enhance the quality of the community. So transformation of the village, benefit for the whole village, tapping their cultural resources, and then uh, enhance the quality of life. So this is the way I want to focus. Uh, how to transform the village? We have to know, of course, our villages are not for sale, not for making money on. But we can transform it in such a way that we protect our culture, we promote our culture, tradition, and other can come, see, learn, and then transform themselves in a go. Uh, we must great transform our villages in such a way that a visitor must feel incomplete without visiting a rural village in Myanmar, in India, or in Nagaland, or anywhere. So we can transform the village to attract at least 800 to 1,000 visitors in a month. Can we do that? If you can do so, then I assure you, you have already created 500 jobs. I will give you an example of this one. If your village is not near down cities, sometimes we think our village is in a remote place. No, it, is, it will have more opportunity because the visitor can stay overnight six hours, 10 hours, huh? and so on. Transform the available resources. I will show you some picture. How just by stone gravel, a sand gravel, you know, how degrade so much of job. I want to show land, forest, mountain, river, stone, culture, and so on. I want to show some picture, pictures how a friend of mine in Taiwan transformed his village. This is his uh, village, a Bonon village, and how he transformed land, culture, community. And then he is a disabled person. He cannot stand. You know, he's a wheelchair person, but he's standing here and speaking with the support of the stick. And then how he transformed, created job. Uh, you enter to a village, you will see every all corner of the village is has a lot of painting. Not just painting, but depicting their cultural traditions. You see here, all this are has a meaning, traditional clothes, meaning 
See, all this has a history, culture connected. Uh, so much. You see, you are not empty. Uh, can we also do it? We have so much of a cultural tradition resources, stories. I am sure we can do it better. If all our walls in our villages and localities are painted like this with our traditional symbols, our young generation will not forget our tradition. You are already imparting. The visitors also will learn and then they will go back with the transform attitude. Understand better what uh, cultural practices we have. I don't want to go into detail because we have no time. Yeah, I hope. Uh, uh, yeah, woodwork. You see, he he created even a museum. Woodwork, bamboo work. You see here. These are not empty objects. They have a history behind. See, he has a bamboo, we have full of bamboo. And then bamboo museum, I was not able to collect. So you see how he transformed. See, bamboo. And then created a museum by different artwork. And then thousands of people come and then revive the Hindu tradition. And then revive culture every day, two, 45 minutes each, two times. More than four, 500 people also come in and see cultural activities. Culture is not for sale, of course, but uh, they try to revive it, protect it, and then teach that culture even to others. So even other people join in dancing. And also they provide organic food. You see, very nice one. So what are the activities you can see, imagine? He said about 10 million people visit that his village annually, 10 million people. And then four truck loads of fruits, vegetable, fishes, meat per week. Apart from domestic consumption, they send it to cities. Make bamboo charcoal, vinegar, food product of bamboo. And then in that restaurant, 300 to 500 people eat every day, sometimes even more in the weekend. And then uh, coffee shops, three coffee shops are there. More than 100 coffee. Kiwi is, was working there. And more than 100 coffee are sold there. Oven traditional clothes wooden shops. They did not buy much from outside, but uh, created from the land and from the resources there. Homestay facilities are provided. Worship every morning from five to six. Produce honey. All kinds of uh, soup, jam, dry food products. And then very interesting. This disabled person has in this set foundation, 99 full-time employee. And then they are not highly educated. They are dropouts. They are drug and alcoholic, drug addict and alcoholic. Some are disabled. And then 44 part-time. Some are students, volunteer workers, foreigners, you know, both from 
of course, a student who come for three months, two months, one month, many. In and around the village, the village was about to be extinct. But because of the foundation he has started, you know, people reassemble. And you know, more than 700 people got jobs, like transportation service, food catering, restaurant, hotel, pharmacy, tea shop, bank, a small shop. So uh, it increases the big community. And then the whole community is transformed. They are able to sustain. And then income per year is, of course, more than 10 to 12 million without any government support. This is how community is transformed. Communities are benefited. I also had uh, been to, uh, I could not collect much, but this is in Malaysia. They created a plastic eco village, recycle for future, a better future. Nothing, they don't have to spend anything. All these are uh, bottles you drink tea or water in a trot and then a group of young people have created a plastic uh, village. When you enter there, you feel very much challenge that how much I contribute towards natural destruction, environmental crisis. So here you come, thousands of people come and go back being transformed. You see? So, uh, I also have been to Bolivia. And then I met uh, that uh, I went to a museum called Stone Cravel Museum. And then six young person with disability, disabled people, wheelchair, some have uh, no hand also, but they are making art by leg. Mm -hmm. And then this whole degraded uh, with less than 200 US dollars. But now I am told he earns more than 3 million annually for the community. And then they have provided jobs for more than 2,000 people. Imagine. And then what did you do? These are just, they don't bring in, they have nothing. Uh, these are the stone they brought it from the river, from the ocean. You see, all these are created out of stone, small stone. You look at it, very interesting, very, see, beautiful things they have created. So a lot of people come to see their creativity. See, all these are just stone. They just created out of uh, it. They have not spent much money. You see? Uh, yeah. So how do we transform the world? After this meeting, we, uh, I am and then Nico is going to take another initiative. And I want to uh, introduce that one here. I am and Nico will conduct another training program on economic development and business from January to July, the first page. And then from July to December, the second page. The course will offer 
fundamental theories and practices of community and economic development, including technical assistance, identification of local resources, community mobilization, and transformational leadership. Okay, so we have designed the course, and if you are interested to see the course, please let me know, I will be very happy to share. And then the objective is not only making money, understand holistic customer. We want to produce. Produce business plan to create jobs. That means whoever graduate must be able to create jobs from whatever resources we have. Not the you know, supermarket, we're not talking about that. Improve quality of life after community. Okay, quality of life because of your activities. You just don't have to mint money, but together we grow together. Improve the quality of life of the community and start help start business in your area. So this program will be uh, facilitated by the expert, very successful uh, business professional and also missionary who are working in the US, New Zealand, and local entrepreneurs who have been already you know, doing engaging. Men and women will share opportunities, challenges of the business development, the problem they face, how they start. Uh, all this we will learn. Nurturing micro and macro businesses, financial planning, marketing, promotion, and people-to-people -people distribution, network, and stewardship. So we will be uh, giving that one. Student who wish to engage towards sustainable development and entrepreneurship will be requested to share their achievable concrete plan of action for economic development and business enterprise. And so for this, we have decided to make a grant, seed grant to start with, so that it allow you to grow seed grant. US dollar 5,000 will be made available to eight to 10 people individual it could be or a group of people in the neighboring area or friends around you can mobilize and then submit your project huh? group of people to initiate the work how many how what are you going to do how you are going to create jobs how it's going to benefit the community All this. so uh, the training program facilitators will examine the feasibility because they have done a lot of work you know, of the project proposal before granting the seed grant. The idea will be worked out in due course of time and then informed to you, to the participants. Okay, even if, I know many people will not get, but even if you cannot achieve or receive the seed crown. You will gain new knowledge on Christian business development and engagement. Because without money also you can start. You will gain new guidance, new insights, tools to identify various entrepreneurial and business opportunity. We will be engaging uh, uh, networking from Thailand and other countries as well. 
identify an enhanced skill and ability to be an entrepreneur. Okay, you will skill. You have already a skill, not using it. So we want to enhance the skill and ability so that you become a successful entrepreneur. Create jobs for the local community. Many of our people are suffering because there's no job. Graduate, but simply staying at home. No, we don't want that situation to occur. So everybody will engage in something to create jobs for the local community and enhance the quality of life. I've given you some uh, three examples. Uh, I could have uh, discussed longer, but I, I just, I hope we can uh, come back. In conclusion, to be young is power. Okay, I'm, I'm getting old. I want to become young. To be young itself is power. That means you can plan, you can contribute, you can do a lot. Land, river, mountain, rock, trees must be protected. Plan your economic activities to protect this one. And use it carefully, not only for you, but for the future. Protect them for the future. Organize people. People can do. Collective efforts, not just with becoming one person rich, but spirit of growing together. If we all grow together, then the society will be better. If you only become rich, then there will be a lot of fighting, bloodshed. So all our activities must be how to grow together. That must be our uh, business plan. And this way, uh, COVID-19 can be overcome. The crisis that has uh, bring by the COVID-19. Always have a long-term plan. At least 100 years, not short term. This is what we need to do. Huh? We need to have honesty, optimism, okay? Optimism, if uh, Japanese and Korean can do, I can do better. Mm, that spirit, I can do better. That spirit must be inculcated. Hard work and dedication, but not con culture. We want to get rich by using con, robbing others. I have been to Singapore several times. Singapore is the richest, one of the richest country in the world, in Asia. I ask, you have no natural resources, even water you have to bring from Malaysia. How it become rich? The simple answer was, we don't have anything. So our hard work, dedication, honesty made us rich. Okay. Honesty, optimism, hard work, and dedication. Not shortcut, not con culture. Clear vision. Resources come with vision. I asked this uh, friend from in Taiwan, how you was so successful? He said, I didn't have anything. I started this foundation with three student tuition and it has grown like this. He said, I, have, I had no money, but I had vision. My vision, I always 
drive towards that one. Develop dignity of labor. You go to his office, sometimes he's uh, only uh, without t-shirt or so. I never saw him uh, wearing a good dress. He's a director still. Working together with the, with the people in the farm. Not necktie, you know? No. Money is there and money is not there. Everybody said, no money, no money, no money. No. Money is there, money is not there. It depends on what you do. Money comes. If you are doing good for the community, it will come. A lot of money will come. So hard work, honesty, dedication, dignity of labor, with that clear vision, you can achieve it. Always start with a big, small, but with a big dream. This is what I want to uh, say. Thank you so much, and uh, I hope uh, I can explain more when question and answer Q and I time comes. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Watilongchar, for your lecture, especially on self-employment to transform our village culture and uh, self-sustenance, and also bringing out examples from the work of Reverend Pai and the Stone Museum from Bolivia. Uh, we are also looking forward to the next training from IM and Niku on economic uh, development and business uh, in the 2022. <laughs> so uh, now for the next session, I give time to Ms. Seno, uh, 30 minutes, if you can uh, please complete your lecture in 30 minutes uh, so that we can have more uh, questions and discussion. Thank you, moderator. Uh... I will try to be precise. <laughs> you can remind me if I don't uh, uh, finish in time. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can see. Okay. Yeah, so uh, thank you, uh, Neku and uh, especially Dr. Watil Longchar, the coordinator of this training program for giving me this opportunity to be back. Uh, I want to clarify, or I want to make it uh, uh, clear that, you know, like I'm not an expert, but uh, a concerned person who uh, works for community well-being in a very small way. And today I would like to share, you know, uh, about food security, sustainable livelihood, self-employment in times of pandemic, and some practical steps. Dr. Wati has brought examples from uh, uh, Taiwan, Bolivia, Malaysia. I'll be bringing about uh, some few key studies which are from the Indian Himalayan states, basically like more from uh, Nagaland, uh, I will not go into further of like like the impacts. We have all seen that livelihood crisis, health crisis, and you know food crisis during the time of pandemic, which we are still facing. Um, so, I would like to share about a, a case study on a woman farmer from my community, who is a mother of five children and a grandmother of maybe some, you know, six seven children by now. Uh, she is a person who practices, you know, biodiverse farming, and uh, a very knowledgeable woman who also tries his, her best to save the seeds. Who also tries her best to, you know, like uh, grow as many as crops as possible. And also somebody who also grows not only food crops but also, you know, like uh, the the cash crops like you know, monkey beans, you know, horti products. And she's somebody, you know, like who, who 
uh, also is a very, you know, like I should say, a one, one good example of a person, a resilient uh, women farmer, because even during the pandemic, she has not really faced problem of food crisis. Uh, she has, in fact, she was some, someone who, who really showed what solidarity economy is all about by sharing her produce with her neighbors, by sharing her produce with elderly people, by, you know, like sharing with people who might be needing most. And she is also somebody who has also been, you know, like able to take some of her produce to the market and could provide healthy food to people who could not really grow. Even like, uh, I, I am from Chizami village, but, there are also some families who are not really into farming because they have left farming for other, you know, like uh, jobs. So, you know, like somebody who, who really like knowledgeable and who is, who is growing diverse crops, keeping, you know, like the, the, the tradition of, you know, like uh, the, the genetic diversity in her field and also somebody who is knowledgeable and be, Beyond her farm, she she also is part of, you know, like collective food producers group, you know, like living with a larger family and community. She has been like one of the best teachers to young people who like to learn about, you know, like biodiverse farming, who wants to learn from her about how, how she keep a big, you know, like uh, farm, farmland where she grows both horty products, both food crops, you know, like which is something that uh, so place where it is always a uh, place worth visiting. Uh, she is also part of the collective knowledge building and through exchange and dialogues. And this has been like a, a very good, I should say, a blessing to the community because this is keeping the practice alive. And you know, like in, in the learning circles where she used to be resource. Uh, resource person to, you know, like many, many uh, uh, programs. There is also like one thing she is being part of that is claiming space through organizing for collective action, whether it is to be through women's society or women's farmers, her uh, group, she has been like, you know, like very active and vocal about speaking about, you know, ecological farming, the importance of, you know, like seed diversity, the importance of, you know, millet-based farming in the climate stressed times. So, you know, like a very resourceful person. And she is one example who says that the pandemic has not really affected her because she has food to eat, she, because she has, you know, like um, she, could, she could well manage her family and also she could also contribute to the larger community. So this is one example that I would like to uh, give when it comes to food uh, security and in times of, you know, uh, pandemic. So achieving a food secure community through indigenous food and farming system. What she has been practicing is an indigenous way of, you know, growing food and indigenous way of living because she is not only taking care of her family, but she is also taking care of the larger community. So, you know, access to common resources, including land, water, forest, seeds, et cetera, which Dr. Wati has already uh, shared, growing food through biodiverse farming, always learn to grow, you know, multiple crops because that can withstand shocks and, you know, especially at, in times of climate change, conserving biodiversity for food and nutrition, side by side rearing livestock animal husbandry, which is very important, livelihood activity in rural household, strengthening solidarity based economy. I think the tragedy of, you know, like, uh, the, the current, the modern agriculture is that you always target for market, but you forget about, you know, people living in your own family, people living in your own neighborhood, people living in your own community. So this is one, one you know, like aspect where we also need to uh, see. And a lot of times, you know, like even during this pandemic, it's the rural people who are foraging wild edible herbs and then sending truckloads to the town, urban areas to share with their fellow community members or even like for frontline uh, workers. And it's also important, you know, like that we support the, the, the local food producers. 
when it comes to sustainable livelihood and self-employment, uh, it's important that if you are thinking of, uh, you know, like uh, self-employment, some activity, livelihood uh, activity, it's important to know your passion, know your interest. A lot of examples uh, the, the previous speaker has shared about, you know, like how can we really create, you know, employment? How can we create jobs? How can we take care, transform communities? I think it's important that if you are to start something like that, it is important to know your passion, your interest area, to source your capacities, what capacities you have, to understand your local ecosystems. If you are from mountains, what are some of the unique selling point that you can use it in promoting your, you know, livelihood activity? When, it, when it, examples can be diversity, handmade, organic, indigenous, you know, like there are so many different uh, examples. It is also to source your resources, to understand the kind of resources. And I have put in more of like in a simpler term, but it is to do with economic resources, social capital, you know, environmental capital. So here I have put, you know, like raw materials, skills, labors, connectivity, market. So one need to understand this and the support systems that you will be needing, whether it is creative facilities, whether it's collaborations, policy support. So, uh, you know, like um, when it comes to, you know, starting anything, I, I think these are some of the points that I see important to identify. And I would like to share with uh, you a person uh, who has started Cold Mountain uh, um, Social Enterprise, whose name is Lanu Akam Imchen. He's based in Dimapur. I happened to meet him in Bhutan in one of the trade fairs. And I would like to give his example because I have seen his work uh, at that time and have been following his work. He's a young graduate who started, you know, like uh, some time back in 2015-16, a value edition, which is, uh, you know, like, um, which is something to do with, you know, spices, tea, you know, and he, he shared that he has started with 3,000 seed money those days. And today he has been like, uh, uh, somehow he has been doing very well. He also got the best organic farmer of uh, India in 2018. He's also like, uh, he was selected by the Ministry of Farmers, Welfare and Agriculture, Government of India under Mission Organic for Integrated Processing Unit, which I was told that it is completed. So like through his initiative, you know, the the slides that you see are some of the brands that he has created uh, under the name Cold Mountains product, uh, Organic Products. And I have also given uh, his uh, web uh, address, which says that it's not really completed, but you can always get the information about his work. And here he is, you know, like share, he has shared that, you know, like every year 50 to 60 intern students come and learn, you know, and also he could indirectly, you know, employ them, you know, not, maybe not full time, but he could give jobs whenever the students need. Not only that, he gives jobs, you know, like in the form of uh, daily wage, uh, you know, wage earning systems like 200 to 300 uh, youths. And also he works or, or he could, you know, like somehow benefit 3000 farmers. And he, his whole, you know, like products ranges from tea and tea, very niche product, I should say, with health benefits and, you know, very good branding he has created for himself. He not only represents, you know, like, uh, in the national platforms, but he has also a couple of times gone to, to outside to showcase his products. And I thought that this is one example that uh, uh, we all can learn from it because he shared that he has started his, uh, his uh, enterprise. The first seed money he has in his hand was only with 3000 rupees. And I should say very inspiring. When we're talking about securing sustainable livelihoods, we need to look, you know, like through lo enhancing local skills, knowledge, and resource use, identifying diverse livelihood opportunities, 
for us, you know, like especially in the mountain areas in hilly states, whether it's you know, like in the northeastern states, a lot of us have, you know, like seen in rural household that they are mainly, you know, like doing subsistence agriculture. They follow somehow a multiple approach, I should say, because they will rear, rear animals, they will have, you know, like uh, uh, farming as the main activity, they will also have, you know, like craft work, they will also have, uh, you know, like uh, foraging from wild to, to you know enhance their livelihood their income so it's important you know like the di diverse livelihood opportunities the the most of the participants here are either students or working with you know like church members maybe some of you are you know like based in urban areas but <clears throat> a lot of you are based uh, in rural areas also. So it is important if we are to facilitate, you know, sustainable livelihood initiatives within, with your members or with your community, it is important to identify these opportunities because diversification of livelihood <clears throat> options is very important if we are to talk about, you know, sustainable livelihood. Emphasize on basket approach, which is somehow like the, the same thing which I have shared, integrated and cross-sectoral perspective. It is also important to, uh, you know, see the value chain, do a value chain analysis, air spurred the geographical local context. If you are from, you know, Mizoram, what should be your value chain analysis? Keeping in mind the, the, the location of your state, your community, you know, the same way if we, we in Nagaland, we are in Nagaland and we are to start a social enterprise, what will be the value chain? You know, that analysis has to be, you know, study done by uh, each one of us. Uh, I would like to share a, a example of a successful uh, uh, producer's company, Mahila Uman, Uman uh, Producer's Company, which is in Ranikate in uh, uh, Almora district in Uttarakhand. And this is, you know, like this woman which you see in the center, Sunita. Uh, she is somebody who is, you know, like she is the co founder and she is the secretary. She supports, you know, through this Mahila Oman Producers Company, she supports, you know, 3,000 households uh, in her area. And through diverse livelihood uh, activities, so the, the, the slides that you see is, you know, like the, the activities that her group does and from, from fruits, horticulture products to gems, jellies, to tea, to, you know, hand woven clothes, to knitting, to, you know, like spices. She could really like give or enhance the livelihood of 3000 uh, 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 families in her area and not only that you know like uh, she has also had uh, somehow like she was successful in this micro critique and uh, which is like a bag and in her words she says that uh, uh, she they need trade and not aid so basically like the whole concept that she has uh, emphasized on building tapping on the resources of her community, the resources that the, the people have, they are very good in knitting. And because they are in a, a hilly state in Uttarankhan, Ranikhet is a very cold area. So knitting, knitting is one thing that she has capitalized, that women knows knitting and that has been like sold. So the marketing, the value chain is very, you know, uh, effectively done and this woman could you know like she started in 2001 in 2009 she registered the self-help groups into producers company in 2018 she could she could you know like uh, make a turnover of four pros and you know like sh she has you know like uh, uh, done in such a way that with her SSG she could really like enhance the livelihood of the people and an example of very good example of a producer's company, which even like the United Nations have mentioned in the Commission for Women's Status 
60 second women status mentioned about her. So I thought uh, I should bring in this example if we are to have or to mobilize some collectives towards sustainable livelihood. There is also a case study which I wanted to share where I'm also part of it, a case study of Chizami Weaves. And uh, this we have started in 2008 with Northeast Network Livelihoods Program uh, to enable women towards sustainable livelihood. And we started with seven weavers in 2008. Now we have around 700 weavers. And um, we, we have uh, somehow, you know, like spread ourselves in three districts of Nagaland. In a very small way, we have, uh, we have started this, but I think the important message that we need to get is that we have used a skill, a traditional skill, which is already existed, existing in the community. The skill is there. The skill is already with the community. It is we who has also somehow diversified the products and have you know, enhance the livelihood of these women weavers. And so this is the value chain that we follow, uh, though it's not a perfect, there is always, you know, like a source from sourcing from materials, supplier procurement to distribution of work, labor management, weaving quality, uh, quality control, finishing tailoring, zero waste, sales, marketing, review, trend, production plan. So this is how we go in circle. This is the value chain of Chizami weaves, which we follow. Uh, these are the products, few products that uh, we, we have, uh, uh, we produce in the, the center where we engage with them, not only on the traditional shows and mechalas. And this is something important that we need to learn because if we are targeting a market, we also need to study the, the demand of the market. And a demand of the market, in the local context, the traditional mechalas, shawls goes very well, but not really the cushion cover, not really, you know, like the table runners and the table mats. This goes to the urban customers. So it's also important for us to, to learn about this. And as Dr. Wati has shared already that Reverend Pai's work has brought many visitors. I think in my village, Shizami, we have brought maximum visitors. People come to understand the loom people come to understand the lives you know to study to document the lives of the weavers who are sustaining their families who are sustaining their communities they have also come to understand you know like the kind of collectives that you know like tr through an enterprise like chizami weaves could could you know like bring together women artisans and you know how this has been transforming even in their social social life so so this is something and also you know like innovations very important in any kind of enterprise that we take up in uh, chizami which we are also trying to you know like revive the traditional lo local cotton and you know like the natural dye that our foreparents used to do, the stinking nettle, you know, the natural fibers. Uh, so, you know, like we are also trying to bring in innovations. We are also trying to bring in, you know, like different skills. And this is very important when we think about uh, any kind of uh, social enterprise. I would like to share um, uh, a little bit on, on you know, like the stories of, you know, like the street vendors. And when we're talking about the margins, I think the street vendors, the daily wage earners, they are somehow like the most margin, marginalized section of our uh, community. In times of pandemic, especially, you know, the street vendors could not really earn anything because of very rigid and strict lockdown. And this was the time when the women together, you know, like got together to help each other. From my district, Peg, the women vendors collected the food produce. They sought the, the, the permission from the district administration and they carried, you know, like loads of, you know, uh, vegetables down to Kohima and they gave it to the Kohima vendors and Kohima vendors could sell because, you know, like there is no transportation, the supply chain was completely, you know, like stopped. And, and it is this time that these women got together 
And here, why I am sharing this example is that in times of crisis like pandemic, the solidarity, the collectives being together, helping each other, creating space for people who are facing problem. You know, uh, this is uh, the, the lady smiling with her ID card is, you know, from Kohima, she's a street vendor. The street vendors themselves, you know, they got together. They are under the umbrella of Self-Employed Women Association, which is one group that men has uh, been facilitating to collectivize them together. They have approached the, the town council, the, the, you know, like the government to give the space for vendors because there is no other livelihood option. And their collective action could relay the need, their need to the government and they have you know, like given permission from, you know, phase wise, first 50 street vendors, second 80 uh, street vendors, phase wise, they have created, you know, space for the vending uh, vendors to come and sell. So this is something, you know, like which we need to also understand, you know, the importance of building collectives and building collectives and supporting them, especially people who are in the margins, people who are real need. And this is one example that, you know, I, I always feel happy to be part of this, you know, like initiative that they could, they could really mobilize. They could really come together to find a space for themselves and to support another sister uh, livelihood in the urban area. So that's uh, uh, one example. And uh, yeah, it is important, you know, like a person can be successful in a business, a person can, a group can be very successful in, you know, like running your business, starting, you know, having a startup and, you know, like earning so much money, but it is important. I feel that it is important for each one of us, especially as Christians, that to ask ourselves or to ask our group whether my enterprise, my action, my livelihood initiative is contributing to the sustainability of the local system, ecosystem. Because the pandemic has taught us until or unless, you know, like you take care of your ecosystem, you try to develop something from within, from tapping not to focus on the needs of the poor people or for the marginalized people, but something to look at to build on from the local available resources of the community. And in doing so, are we contributing towards the sustainability of our ecosystem? Are we contributing to the larger good of the community or is it only like me, myself, my family, my clan? Or are we really talking about, you know, like the, the initiative that we have taken? Are we really, contributing to the larger good of the community because self-sufficient is not enough if the community is not self-sufficient. Self-sufficient for an individual will not be uh, enough if the community at large is you know, suffering. So I think it's important to even reflect back on that and contributing and enhancing the livelihoods of the local people. I may be doing you know, like a lot of you know, like, uh, a business, a successful business intervention. But is that enhancing the livelihoods of the local people, of the people who are producing, of the people who are foraging, of the people who are growing? I think these are some of the important reflections that we really need to make. And uh, I want to show you this. I have selected this um, to also explain a little bit. I think I have... Uh, maybe two minutes more, I don't know. Um, but I just need to uh, share about this box. Uh, for uh, many of us, it may be just an attractive gift box, but this has a very uh, good meaning. You see a bamboo uh, uh, basket, which is from one local youth group. You see the woven cloth which is from Chisami weaves, the products from Chisami weaves. You see a green packet, which, which contains collar, rice beans from Tuen San, Shamator, Yung Chun community. 
you have you also see a red packet which is uh, uh, a millet from uh, Puchuri community. You also see you know like two two uh, brown packets which is uh, which contains of rosella flowers, dried rosella flowers for tea uh, from Chagasan area and. Uh, a chili packet, which is from Northern Angami area. And uh, yeah, the basil, basil flowers is from uh, Peg, Peg village, I think so, yeah. So this is the basket approach I'm talking about. You are selling this in the market as a Christmas gift, which carries, you know, like different livelihoods, you know, produce the food produce, the hand woven, the handcrafted produce from different communities. And this basket may cost 2000 rupees as Christmas gift, uh, you know, packet. It, that 2000 is shared by four or five communities. And uh, I wanted to end that, you know, like whatever we do, let us see who is benefiting most. Is it only me or is it the larger community? And I think uh, I will end here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Seno, for your insight, really bringing up very practical and case study from tribal, Peg tribal communities, and also from Chisami Weaves, your examples from the local interpreter. And I think I couldn't agree more to your points in the reflection where you mentioned about contribution to the local ecosystem, the local community, and enhancing the local people. Thank you so much uh, for your lecture and insight. And now we will have the question and discussion. Uh, in the chat box, uh, we ha I have uh, two questions for Dr. Wati and one uh, comment. So if Dr. Wati can please answer to that. If uh, you cannot find it, I can say it for you. I got it now. Uh, one question is uh, elaborate more on entrepreneurs from your PowerPoint and how this can, this tonight topic be related to with a Bible student. Very much related to the Bible student. We talk about holistic mission, holistic ministry. We have been emphasizing only on one dimension of ministry. So we want to break that you know, the Reverend Pai I mentioned, he's an ordained minister. He has done MD. And he said he learned three days how to cultivate mushroom. And that is the turning point in his life. So the village, his ancestral village, which was shrinking, you know, reduced to around 30, 40 families. Everybody moving to the city, living a difficult life. Slum, some are doing, some are in the very dangerous factory area they are doing. Now, more than one or two, 3,000 family around already came. Uh, it's already a township from uh, nothing to township. So that is called giving life to the community to live a dignified life. So for me, this is very biblical. Uh, maybe I could not uh, explain as you expected, but uh, you see, uh, next time, when we are going to do this one, economic development, full of Bible only, but focus, you know, theology and practice of uh, yeah. See, theology and practice of holistic Christian ministry, business enterprise development to bless and transform the community, which is very much there in the, in the Bible. Theology of faith-based 
in social entrepreneurship. You see, community impact on the holistic business. You see? Uh, so, I don't know what uh, you are asking, but for me, the gospel that we talk today is not only soul winning, but the holistic community development. You cannot go to heaven without with empty stomach. What people need is food, especially after this pandemic. This is what I want to uh, say. But if somebody can also highlight, I'll be very happy. One is there. Lecture is very impressive. It will be really beneficial. Uh, it will really benefit unemployed youth. If you could kindly highlight some training avenues. Yes, there are many trainings are organized by the government by the NGOs, by the churches also. If you want to go to uh, Taiwan, Reverend Pai, he will be most happiest person to have you and see how they work. So there are many avenues if one is willing to go, even not, even if you don't go to the foreign, even agree universities. I also have a uh, I think Dr. Kain has uh, taken a training how to fishery, you know, fishery. I myself is uh, taken a training on bigry. If you want to learn how to rear pigs, I am always there. I am a successful uh, bigry man. Okay, and then uh, thank you. Okay. Yes, I think the common is very right, you know, we have uh, we have no unemployment problem, but we have unemployable problem. Okay? We are not we are unemployed, unemployable because we have no skill. This is very important. We should come up with the skill so that we employed. I still I, uh, remember, you know, one uh, dropouts. You know, education dropouts means we think that the one's person life is over, finish. But one person drug attack, he just class 10 pass. It was a nuisance to the family, problem for the father and mother. So I said, you identify what is exactly his interest. His interest is a mechanical, small, small thing repairing. So why not uh, uh, we send him for that kind of mechanical training three months? He did it. And then father just bought a second hand welding machine. Okay. That become a turning point in his life. He was. Now he has employed six or seven people. He has bought a big house. He has, he's a giver now. When he see me, how much money you want, please uh, let me know. I can also help you. The one who is thrown out is being transformed. Transformed. I can see completely different. No more drugs. He's already changed. He's a community, you know, contributor, development worker. And then, how much 
you give to the employee? He said, 15,000 per month. Then what? I think we have, I, one thing that I found in some places, colleges is that how do great jobs is a core subject. But here in South Asia, we receive only colonial education. How to become a, become a slave of somebody. I still, I remember my son, two son always come. And then the words that we parents say is, steady hard, competitive exam, competitive exam, all the time. So one time my eldest son said, do you have anything to say more than this? Do you have anything? Every time I come, every night we have a prayer meeting, this word bombarding us. And then what should I say? He said, other parents are saying, how many people can, can we employ? Other parents are showing this one, but you are saying competitive exam, competitive exam. every night, every holiday, you are saying this one. Shouting at us, shouting at me, you know. After that, I stopped saying that one. This is the problem. We have, we have to change our attitude, our mindset, and our education. Don't think that MA, doctorate, pay alone are the solution for your life. No, even without high qualified uh, education, you know, degree, you can still do it. This is what. The, I want to tell. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Other can also compliment. Uh, yes. Or if, if, can also compliment. PC can also can compliment because he is a fish man. Uh, yes, Miss Seno can also supplement if she's willing. And uh... yes, already shared enough. So I think, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I just have one. Uh, just one question for Miss Seno. Uh, uh, since uh, Miss Seno has a lot of experience, especially from Northeast India, uh, you have given a very good lecture on how we can self-employ and self-sustain. So I just want to know uh, what are some of the practical challenges, especially the Northeast uh, youth are facing right now to be self-employed or to self-sustain or to contribute to the community? What are some of the practical challenges that they are facing? I think as uh, Reverend Dr. Wati has shared about, you know, like the loss of purpose, what are my interest area? What is my passion? You know, the kind of education system that we have been taught, you know, like that we uh, study to or pass examinations, but not really like practical, uh, or, you know, like, uh, capability. So I think, you know, like one is, of course, like the way we have been raised uh, up. That's also, you know, something to do with white color jobs, uh, you know, aspiration to be, you know, white color jobs to do. It is not work if you are not employed in the government, you know, sector, you know. Even, even a young person who is working hard to earn a livelihood 
who is self-employed by using his skills or her skills. Still, the community's question directed to that particular person who is earning a livelihood for her, himself or herself will be, are you not going to work? Are you not, are you remaining like this? You know, when we, the community as a whole, the society looks at self-employment that we don't consider that if you are not paid by a government, uh, you know, like sector, that's not work. So I think the whole attitude, the whole, you know, like uh, uh, way of looking at work itself, uh, you know, is one of the biggest challenges and uh, already shared, you know, that work hard. If you don't study hard, if you don't want to work like us in the field, in the farmland, I think a very wrong concept. Uh, that, that has gone inside. It is already internalized in the minds when we are very young. Oh, we have to study hard. We have to pass examination. I think those are some of the problems. Besides that, if we are to look at some of the practical challenges in the Northeast is, of course, like the, the, the area, the geographical specifications that we are located, the market in the, the connectivity problem, the transportation cost, you know, the, the, Transportation cost from Delhi to Dimapur is equal to Dimapur to Chizami, which is just 160 plus kilometers, you know, where thousands of kilometers you, you have brought raw materials from Delhi. That is as expensive as 160 plus kilometers between Chizami and. So, you know, like a high cost on, you know, like connectivity, transportation, you know, we talk of digital India. Now, especially with pandemic, we really have to do online marketing, you know, but we could not really do it. There is also, you know, like difficulty in getting financial credit facilities. That is also another, you know, and I think some of the basic challenges will be, of course, like if you really want to compete in the market and really want to make your products niche, I think, you know, like a lot to do with value addition, a lot to do with, you know, marketing skills, a lot to do with, you know, branding of your products, a lot to do with, you know, uh, you know, making it, you know, like uh, stand out as niche product as a diversity that, you know, like you, the, the, the kind of, you know, like product that you want to promote it. I think some of still like we are, you know, like uh, really uh, somehow uh, uh, scared or I know, I, I don't really know whether not confident really, to, you know, like to use the full potential that is present. Otherwise, if I see my own Naga community, very innovative, even the designs, very, very, you know, like creative. The kind of paintings that, you know, like they do on the t-shirts, the kind of textile weaves that women make, very creative with colors, with the play with colors they get, you know. So I think, you know, the, the platform that we, we are not getting enough, maybe one, but also like lack of, you know, direction is one big factor. Lack of, you know, uh, 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 you know, like sourcing one's own capacities and really looking within one's, you know, uh, ecosystem, resources, looking at those. I think we need, we really need to open up our eyes more. And also, you know, I think, uh, I feel that a lot of young people are lost, mainly because we have no direction. We have not really like, uh, we don't really think out of the box. I, I feel that it's in three different, uh, three, four different levels that the young people are facing challenges. And that can be within oneself, but also like the external, you know, whether it is to do with social capital or whether it is to do with economic capital. I think, you know, there are, uh, I should say, there are uh, multiple factors that hinders or that is uh, responsible for, you know, especially youths of. Uh, the region to come forward, but also to be hopeful. And then I think I'm very optimistic. In the last few years, we see lots of young people coming out, uh, successful entrepreneurs that I have shared one example of Lanyu Akum, who is also now, you know, like uh, doing well. So, yeah. 
thank you so much, Ms. Seno. Uh, if there's any more questions from the participants. Yeah, good evening. Can I ask a question? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my question is, to start anything, we need a economic background because financially I have to be strong. Because suppose I am interested, suppose I found people who also wanted to do fishing or they want to have fish farming. So they need a pond. But for a pond, I need money. And the thing is that as a church, suppose in our diocese we have some five, six ponds, but it has been given in uh, to some other people for uh, yearly contract. But the church, uh, my suggestion is the church should uh, encourage people or encourage the diocese should encourage the people for their own benefit so that the people can be can start their own thing facing like that. They have pond, they can give it to their people and they should uh, have a, uh, every time they should give the training to their own people so that they can start their own resources. What we are missing, although we have the resource, but we are not uh, getting the amount of things from the resources. We are looking for other people. We are giving it to a uh, contract with a one year contract to somebody who will be giving us 15,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 in a year. But we can make it 50,000 because if we can encourage our people or if we can develop a skill among them, so that will help totally our society as well as our community to grow. Uh, we are missing on this point. As a church, if you can develop these things, as a diocese, if you can develop all these things, then it will be very helpful. Because as an individual, I need a financial background. If I am going to start something, if I don't have any financial support behind me, so it, it become I have thousands of questions in my mind. If I fail, tell what I'll do, if I'll take any loan, whether I can repay it or not. These are the certain things which is there in my mind. So if these things can, we can develop in our, uh, with us or we can advise, or if we can give some financial support so that we can move forward. Thank you. Yeah. If you're gonna something on this. Yeah, that's uh, very important. We need uh, resources to start, but I have also mentioned that Resources is not number one. You have to find out yourself what is the best talent you have, the community resources, nature resources, then money, money should come. Without vision, if money comes, <clears throat> then you will just consume it and then finish up. That's why next training will focus on the theoretical, how you identify resources, your talent, and then after mapping out all those, we have decided to make a small grant, 5,000 US dollar. That means uh, in Indian movies, it will be around uh, 3 lakh something, yes. I think. So it is there. Churches, yes, you are right. Churches have resources. Churches have potentiality, local churches, diocese, but we don't use it for the community development. Mostly charitable work, but skill oriented and then enabling young people to start entrepreneurship so that the local community, local people have benefited. I think this is what we are missing. And also those who are in the theological colleges, you will not see even a single course on community development. This is the set reality. That's why we just produce a pastor with a necktie and then preach. I, uh, I was when I was teaching in the college. There was a person always with a necktie. But every time we, I meet him, his words are complain about the salary. No salary, no salary. But he's always with a necktie. He doesn't work. 
but it was a man. Same family, same family, uh, number of children, but he works from early morning in the night. He allowed the land to produce food. He never, I have never heard him complaining <laughs> that salary is less. Never. He will distribute food to everybody, all the community. I have a saving bank, he said. I have a saving bank. Every day, instead of buying and then uh, do the market and then buying, he himself produce and then he eat organic food. This is something, you know, uh, we, we have to learn how to sustain and allow the land. Huh? Sino has already uh, explained, allow the land to produce food, enough food for us. And also other, of course, innovative economic activities that uh, Mohandi has mentioned is also important. Yes, thank you. Uh, can I make one or two comments? Um, just to substantiate what uh, Dr. Wati has been saying. Uh, uh, it is good to explore our own talents, interest, passion. But at the same time, if we can check also the like-minded people around me, uh, around my locality, around my region, and then this like-minded people, interest or passion can come together and can undertake something greater. Uh, what one person cannot do when they are four or five in number, they can undertake that uh, impossible thing and they can work. They can discuss, they can plan ahead strategically and that can work uh, very well. Uh, even the uh, post product uh, things also, they can plan and they can uh, work ahead. And in that case, uh, yes, we can uh, seek uh, cooperation from others, not necessarily financial, uh, even from advice, uh, uh, from uh, the uh, sharing of experiences, that can also help. So we can do that. Second thing that I would say that many of us may be uh, in one way or the other engaged in the church activities. Uh, whether in the youth committee or in the uh, uh, working committee or whatever it may be, Sunday school or youth program or anything. Now, uh, if we can find out from them uh, their own talents and how they are contributing to the uh, church as a whole or to the community as a whole, and if those diversities can be collected together, and can be used for a greater cause that also can uh, be uh, quite helpful uh, for the entire community. And I think the time has come when individualistic living uh, carries no meaning, but one has to live in relation to other. And then only we find meaning in our life and we give life to the community as a whole. And that can be the uh, policy of our living today. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just uh, addition. Next time that we are planning, you see, we found that if it is institution control, hardly we get success. Institution business run is like everybody child, but nobody child. Nobody takes care. Everybody wants to get only benefit. That's why we thought it should not come under the control of any institution or church. 
it should be individual or like-minded people coming together, forming, and then deciding that this is ours. We will uh, pursue this one. This is, we'll take it as a vocation so that the community are benefited. Uh, this is what we want to uh, see. Okay, uh, are there any more questions or queries or comment from the participants? Yeah, if uh, there are no questions or clarification, uh, I will just uh, give the rest of the time uh, to Wati Longchar to conclude the session. Yeah. And if there's any more information. Yeah, I want to inform that Next, tomorrow we don't have a class. We will have a next Friday, that is, no, Thursday, on 18th of this month, to have the concluding session. And then we will hear from four or five person successful, say, entrepreneurs. What shall we do after uh, post-COVID context? What they are doing? We want to listen uh, the stories from them, the testimony. After that, uh, we will announce the book price. The people who have uh, submitted the... the uh, I will give you the question tomorrow morning. And then you must submit it by 15th so that we evaluate and then select the best uh, answers and then uh, give the give the price book price. And also please submit your name to KV. I will, I will give her email address when uh, she will receive all the application. Write your correct names, official name for issuance of the certificate from NICO. Once you have uh, issued the certificate means it is difficult to reissue again. It will be issued through the email but very nice design of the, of the certificate. So I'm sure you'll uh, all come in on uh, 18 and then submit your, again, I'm reminding, submit your answer by 14, but not long. It should be maximum 250 to say 300 words. If you write too long, then we have no time for evaluation. Bullet point also will be helpful. Okay, that's, that's all, Sashi. Okay, uh, thank you so much uh, for the information. I, will, I hope the students have made it clear, but I think the in charge of each institute will remind you again. Thank you so much to Ms. Seno for taking up your time for the insights and for your lecture, uh, for also uh, answering the questions, even to Dr. Wati. Thank you so much uh, to all the participants who have attended today and for the questions and uh, the comments that you have given. I pray and hope we had a meaningful time you know, to contribute, to self-employ and contribute to your community. So thank you so much. In Nepal, we always conclude with Jay Masi uh, here whenever we have any fellowship or program. So I would like to conclude with Jay Masi and I pray we will have a wonderful uh, time at our last session. Thank you to all. Thank you.